So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 70 years ago today, 12 courageous nations came together to form an alliance that to this day remains the bedrock guarantor of Western security and democratic liberties. Today, our 29 nations believe in our founding mission. We believe in deterrence to keep the peace. We believe in our common defense as captured in Article 5 of the treaty. We believe that Western democratic ideals are worth defending and defend them we will. Our nations have inherited a strong alliance because our predecessors had the wisdom to continue to adapt to the challenges at hand. And now it's our duty to adapt to the challenges like radical Islamic terrorism, cyber attacks, uncontrolled migration, Chinese strategic competition, and indeed still Russian aggression. Today we had wide-ranging, robust discussions. We took important decisions on urgent problem sets. Vladimir Putin harbors dark dreams of imperialism. This is evident from his invasions of Georgia and Ukraine and his meddling in Syria, and now in Venezuela. He wants to split our alliance and weaken our democratic resolve. In light of Russia's attacks on Western democracies, we agreed to improve our defenses against hybrid warfare, develop new strategies to deter it, and identify prompt and effective responses. We also discussed terrorism. NATO plays a key role in the fight against Islamist terrorism, both inside and outside of our alliance. The U.S. especially appreciates NATO's commitment to the NATO mission in Iraq. For nearly 18 years, NATO allies and partners have fought terrorism in Afghanistan. We've trained and advised and assisted the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. I updated our NATO counterparts on the work of Ambassador Khalilzad, his di diplomatic undertaking is executing at my direction. The United States will ensure that our collective sacrifices are not wasted and that terrorists can never again threaten us from Afghanistan's soil. Lastly, we discussed burden sharing. No alliance can survive without proper investment from all of its partners. Our allies have joined the United States in recognizing the need for greater burden sharing, each and every one of them. I'm pleased to say that since 2016, our allies have pledged $41 billion, and that number will increase to $100 billion by the end of next year, 2020. That's no small feat. It's money well spent. Nations have contributed should be proud. We have, you have the deep gratitude of President Trump for that. But I told them, too, there's more work to do. It's important for them to make the case to their citizenry for why this collective deterrence remains important that spending commitments matter. They lead to political solidarity. Uh, as a military alliance, our posture should be second to none. It's self-evident that our armies, navies, and air forces must be fully trained and equipped and ready to go when called upon in conflict or crisis. At the Leaders' Summit last July, we took a major step forward in agreeing to the 430s initiative. Now it is time for us to fulfill those goals. 70 years ago, the great Dean Acheson said that the NATO alliance was, quote, a statement of the facts and lessons of history, end of quote. He knew that if free nations do not stand together, they will fall one by one. The same is true today. As for the United States, we will continue to bear our fair share. We will continue to lead within NATO, and by doing so, we will defend the freedoms of the American people and the people of our allies. I'm happy to take a few questions. Let's start off with Latvia TV, Ina Stratzgina. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Mr. Pompeo, Ina Stratzgina, uh, Latvian television. Uh, seeing growing uh, uh, aggression of Russia, uh, do you see that NATO presence in the Baltics is sufficient, or would you see uh, uh, even uh, plans to strengthen it even more? So there's lots of discussion always uh, at this meeting, at the summit, uh, at the leaders' meeting last July, about proper allocation of resources. Where are the, where are the right places? Where do we need to do more? Uh, we've certainly talked about that as a geographic matter. So I don't have anything to add with respect to the Baltic states today. Um, but it's not just a geographic matter. We've also talked about uh, new challenges that face us, right? So telecommunication systems, uh, infrastructure, cyber, hybrid warfare, uh, things that uh, aren't resolved by more troops sitting on the ground someplace, but which present risk to the Baltics, 
to all of Europe, to all the NATO partners, including the United States and Canada as well. So we're, we're trying to make sure that our resources, our focus, are meeting the challenges of today. We talked a lot about it, the 70th anniversary, we talked a lot about the history of the founders of the 12 nations that began this uh, important alliance and the fact that it's now our time, uh, the leaders of today, to take on the mantle and the challenges that the world presents to NATO today. Let's go to BBC, Barbara Plett Usher. Test, test. Um, Mr. Secretary, on Turkey, the Turks are disputing your readout of the meeting you had with the Turkish Foreign Minister this week. So my question is, have you made any progress in meetings this week um, on issues like the S-400s and northern Syria, or have things actually gotten worse? And then I have another question about China. Uh, NATO allies have not followed U.S. requests to cut off Huawei. Um, so, do you think that that could become a risk for intelligence sharing and military communications in the alliance in the future? So, as for the first question, I, I reread, I, I saw the comments by my Turkish counterpart. I reread the readout of our meeting. Spot on. Stand by every word of it. We are continuing to have conversations. I think the Turkish government understands the American position quite clearly. I think I heard the vice president speak to that yesterday as well. Uh, our, our position hasn't changed. Um, there's great opportunities for the United States and Turkey to work closely together, and I had a, a good long conversation with my, with the uh, Turkish Foreign Minister yesterday, and I'm very confident we'll find a path forward. Uh, as for the risks associated with the installation of Chinese technology in systems related to security, there is undoubtedly uh, the risk that uh, NATO or the United States will not be able to share information in the same way it could if there were not Chinese systems inside of those networks, inside of those capabilities. Uh, we've done our risk analysis in the United States. We have now shared that uh, with our NATO partners, with countries all around the world. Uh, they understand the concerns, not our concerns, but the factual concerns associated with uh, companies so deeply connected to their own government who would be willing to act at the behest of their government, the risk that that presents to information management. And we've made clear um, that if the risk exceeds the threshold for the United States, we simply won't be able to share that information any longer. And our, our task is to do education, make sure they understand every sovereign nation that will make its own decision, and then the United States will make its decision. Let's go to Italy, La Stampa, Paolo Mastro Lilli. Thank you very much. Uh, to question today, the uh, Libyan general Haftar ordered his troops to march on Tripoli. Did you discuss them? Uh, this issue in terms of the uh, tr uh, terroristic threat from the south. And uh, the second question, Italy signed the BRI uh, uh, initiative uh, with China. Do you consider that to be a threat to the uh, interoperativity of NATO? So the, with respect to the first question, Libya, I don't have anything to add. Uh, we're following closely what has been taking place there over the past weeks and months. Uh, we've been following the UN process trying to do the best we can to be uh, a positive force to deliver a good solution for the people of Libya and uh, increased stability there, to be sure. Uh, second, as, as I said in response to the previous question, uh, every country has to make its own decisions about how it wants to respond to uh, Chinese uh, debt trap diplomacy or Chinese efforts to uh, sell goods at below market that clearly have a security component to the transaction. Uh, but each nation will make its own choices. Then uh, the task falls to every other country to observe that, see what risk it presents uh, to them if they begin to engage in those systems and that infrastructure, that IT infrastructure or transportation infrastructure, and respond to that threat. Germany, DPA, Ansgar Haas. Let me, let me just add one thing to that. It is one thing to compete in an open, fair, transparent way. The United States is prepared to compete with our NATO allies, with China, with any country that shows up with a commercial transaction, a better mousetrap, a, a better idea, and compete with uh, fair, reasonable, trans transparent transactions. It is a very different thing to engage in transactions that have a national security component to them. When, when a nation shows up, and offers you goods that are well below market, one ought to ask what else is at play, why it was that that entity showed up with a deal that is literally too good to be true. DPA, please. 
Thanks, um, Marin Hennemu, TPA. Um, the president and the vice president have been quite clear that they um, want Germany to step up on defense spending. So, but according to the latest projection, they won't even reach 1.5% in 2024. Um, what concrete consequences is the U.S. considering um, if they don't step up? Do you have any steps in mind, like withdrawing troops from Germany? It's important to uh, step back just a bit. Remember that this notion of 2% isn't made up. It wasn't created by this administration in the United States. It wasn't created by the previous administration in the United States. It was a commitment that every NATO ally agreed to in Wales. That includes Germany, who committed to that. So the promise that is being fulfilled is a promise that the German government made. So we're very hopeful. We're very hopeful that they will get it right. Uh, that they will understand that it is important for our collective defense, and uh, we will urge them to continue to do so. One more. We have Norway, Aften Posten. No? Please, go ahead. I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, Secretary, I'm from Spain, from ABC. Um, did you uh, manage to talk about Venezuela and uh, the presence of Russian troops in Venezuela as a part of the meeting today, and what's your position regarding those 100 soldiers that, according to uh, Special Envoy Abrams, were calibrating a missile system? We did talk about Venezuela. Uh, the American position was made clear by President Trump. <laughs> they, need to, they need to leave. And we talked about that. Uh, we talked about that in the context of uh, Russian efforts all around the world, whether that's efforts in Ukraine, uh, the Russians continued uh, malign activity in Syria, we talked about it in Venezuela, we talked about what they did in the Sea of Azov. In each case, we are doing our best collectively to respond in the case of Venezuela. Uh, the United States has its responses being prepared as well. One more question. Um, Sir, in the, the pink shirt back there, please, <laughs> yes. Hello, uh, my name is Farhad Puladi. I'm with the Voice of America Persian Service. In your morning's remark, you said um, NATO should seek peace through strength uh, in era of great power competition from Russia, China, and Islamic Republic of Iran. So my question is this, uh, what challenges the NATO and specifically the US is facing from a uh, regime in Tehran? Thank you. The list is long, uh, but let me speak about it in, in countries other, the risk to countries other than the United States. I've articulated the threat that uh, we believe the Islamic Republic of Iran presents to our country. They are, they are many. Uh, we've asked the Islamic Republic of Iran to simply behave like a normal nation, but give me, let me give you a concrete example. Today, there continues to be a concerted assassination effort, campaign, inside of Europe. We've seen it, you've seen European countries respond to this threat. Uh, this is real. This, is, this, isn't, this isn't something that was made up. This is an effort by the leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The President Rouhani, who's the president of Iran, is permitting to take place, where they're going to Europe and killing people on European soil. This is unacceptable in, in Western Europe to allow something like this to happen is just unacceptable. We are working with our partners all around Europe to make sure we all have the right information placed in the right place at the right time to reduce this risk and reduce this threat. But a second component of this is the deterrence effort, which is the undertaking that the United States is engaged in to reduce the capacity of the Islamic Republic of Iran to undertake precisely this kind of activity by sanctioning them in a way that forces them to have fewer resources so that they can create these risks around the world. I'll give you a second one we spent time on today. There are European foreign terrorist fighters sitting today in Iraq and in Syria that we now have to figure out a way to make sure do not return to the jihadi battlefield. The uh, efforts that Iran is engaged in in Syria fundamentally make that problem set more difficult. 
as do Iranian Shia militias that are not under the control of the Iraqi security forces in Iraq. That malign activity by Iran makes Europe, NATO countries, less secure. We talked about those. We talked about how we would collectively seek to approach them to reduce the risk to NATO members. Great. Thank you all very much for being Thank with me all. today. Thank you, Mr. Secretary.